I just I never, I just never use the video because I hate myself on video. And again, like I just told you, my listeners. Look at the video. What are you talking about? Well, uh, it, it, well, I mean, my my listeners tend to literally listen. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, I have you in the background." So yeah. it's like, okay, so you're not watching the screen, so therefore, yeah, I can just yeah. use slides yeah. or whatever. I have, um, I have some visuals that help me kind of unpack some of the questions that you, you asked. Do? I mean, like, no, I mean, so I'll be able to share them. Look at this. What? What? Hi, Zach. Very exciting. That's that is uh, very exciting. It's just, I I learned I I because my first two or three hundred interviews um were <laughs> not video. I had to no, learn no. how to do everything without video. Yeah. So now yeah. when I watch like David Weiss and some of the other guys, I'm jealous because they're like, oh yeah, they insist on video going in, and they've got tons of screens to throw up there. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I yeah. have to verbalize yeah. it, but it's okay. It's one of my yeah. things. I mean, I'm, I'm a storyteller, so. Yeah, I mean it's a whole different kind of skill set that you yeah. have to do just uh, just by by dint of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other people, so uh, they'll just put the stuff and go, look at that, look at that right there. It's right there on my screen. It okay, is. So what are we? Sorry. Go interesting. ahead. No, 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 no. So, thank you. Let's let let's do it. But we're both the sorts of people who run off on rabbit trails. So let's keep to this. So here's how I imagine the next hour going. Okay. Um, that you ask one of your questions and I respond, and okay. then you respond to that response and whatever. Um, uh, when you're presenting your question, I'll just let you present it. Um. Uh, and then we can have kind of a back and forth there. And okay. then we'll just do, you know, go back and forth. One question. We each have three questions. Um, so six questions. So it should take us, you know, 10 minutes. Usually when I do these things, we run a bit over and it's always kind of terrifying. Oh, no, no, that's uh, fine. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. I do only because I have dinner with friends tonight and I don't want to let them down. Um, oh, so okay. I then, I, then, I'll, over, then, but... I'll, then I'll keep my stuff fairly brief. Sure. Usually, sure. I mean, I can, you, if you've heard any of my stuff, I can go off on a rabbit hole and then go off road and then go in a completely different region. And then sometimes I'll actually forget where I am. And then I'll ask like, so <sighs> what was the original question that we were I talking that about? All the time in, uh, in, in interviews, it's fun to be the expert of something enough that you can just like connect X to Y to B to like Aleph. To, yeah. You know, yeah, where it's like, okay, know. three points. One, and then B, you know, <laughs> B sub and, three. And, yeah. and then, and then what's the third point? Oh, there was no third point. I just, yeah. it's <laughs> good, it's that was like 15 through. minutes ago. What are you talking about? <laughs> you think anybody remembers that? Right. So let me, let me, um, you and I, of course, have had a phone conversation before this, which I very much enjoyed, by the way. Oh, good. Um, I think for our eventually listening audience, yeah. Uh, what I would like to just kind of sketch out right now is my hope in this, and then you can say any hopes that you have for this, but you, you're a master of this, but I don't know. I hope to offer you something different, but you know, it's hard to do because you, you never just, know. You never you're, know. You're I mean, I, I, I erroneous, erroneously said at one point, I said, you know, if you give me an original question, I haven't heard, you know, in, in two years, I'd love to, I'd love to hear it, but you never know. I mean, you, you seem like yeah. a like a yeah. fairly quick-witted guy, so I got a funny feeling you might be able to throw a wrinkle at me. I have a science advisor. I have a degree in world history, sorry, world uh, European history, and then another one in world religions. Oh, wow. So I am totally not trained in the sciences, but I come wow. to the sciences from a and humanities that, perspective, and which turns you, out is good. It's, it's actually very useful. You have that eclectic thing. That's, is that a green screen or is that real? Are those physical objects behind you? Oh, look at that. Those are real. My son made this and actually you might even use this later, but uh, I always had this in the background. This was chosen specifically for this. But, uh, yep, an Apollo rocket. 1,969 pieces, which I bet you can catch the um, the, the relevance of in the, when the Lego people made it because the Saturn V went up in uh, 1969. Uh, I get the nine, so it's exactly how many pieces. I get the saber tooth. I get the microscope. That's very nice. And the lava lamp. Oh, that dates me. But what is that little white glowy base thing over there i don't know that anybody has ever asked that question it's a breakable is, the, is it an actual the it's a little um fake light bulb that's a fake light bulb i got it i don't know oh, it's some oh, sort of home oh, goods oh, like an upside like down light bulb. and then i yeah yeah exactly yeah i guess it's not good enough no to i'm, I'm drawn to unique things thing, so i was like that does not i do not recognize that that would show up on sesame street and which of these things doesn't belong here and by the way the globe behind you I am so hyper aware of globes. No, it's right. When you turn the I other way, I mean, it's yeah. all, it's in frame off your right shoulder when you're, when you're yeah, just yeah, talking yeah. to me anyway, but I am so hyper aware of them that, yeah, my eyes are immediately drawn to it. Every television show, every movie. Uh, it's amazing how quickly I've drawn. Well, do you see what's different about this globe? 
It might, it might be um, it's an old it's an old world map. I can't tell is, what what is. century is that globe supposedly. I mean, it's just sepia toned. It's nothing. It's nothing. Well, cool no, like no. I mean, actually, sorry, it actually has the USSR in it. Um, but it's oh. upside down. Oh, everybody it, like has this like kind of picture of like oh, it's 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 Australia that you're seeing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. Indonesia, I, like, pink Indonesia you above can't, it. Or you below can't it. tell. So you reverse the spindle. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Very good. Yeah, I mean it's broken, so it really just goes on either way, just as easily. And, and I used, um, but you know, it's all about subverting expectations. And I used to collect globes back in the day. Again, I was right. I started out so really? far in the negative. Oh yeah, I was I had my yeah. world, my my walls were covered with world maps, deliberately so that yeah. um, uh, I, I joke people. I go, if I ever suffer a concussion, I'll wake up and I'll know where I am, right? Because I'll just have to look at the walls. It's like, oh right. Ah! This is where I am. And I used to collect little <laughs> little antique globes and take them off the spindles. I was fascinated oh, yeah. with it. So nobody yeah. started in a deeper hole than I did, other than I didn't have mm. a degree in physics. So. Well, so let's let me let's say the, the thing that I hope. No, this is great. This is great. Um uh people eat this up. I'm told. I don't know if that's actually true. I think I do. What back and forth? Yeah, like, like the kind of the pregame back and forth. Yeah. I really they, like it when do. I hear that. Anyway. Yeah. So the reason that I was so excited to contact you when I saw the documentary Behind the Curve is right. you I've been so wanting to engage with the Flat Earth community for a really long time. I I learned um what I understand to be well, I, I learned mainstream science. I understand I I learned what I understand to be truth um by specifically when I was in high school digging in middle school, digging into scientific controversies that like a, a lot of scientists like look at and say like this isn't a controversy. Everyone who believes X is an idiot and we should talk down to them. But I was lucky enough that I was actually, mine was um, uh, young earth creationism. I dove into it and like, that is what taught me about paleontology. That is what taught me about geology. It's what taught me about evolution. It's what taught me about so atmospheric science. It taught me about so many things. Right. And I've always thought that, oh man, if I could only get into like flat earth theory, then I would understand so much more about the world. And when I saw you on the documentary, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really like this guy. You come across as like one of the world's, I don't know, like 99 point something percentile most likable people. Okay. And so I was really excited. Like, maybe you could like write a really cool email to this guy and like, maybe like a one in, one in two and three chance, like maybe he could respond to me. So thank you very much for doing, and thank oh, you no, for no. being the celebrity judge for um, that, that contest. And that believe it or not, I respond to, um, mostly respond to enthusiastic, inquisitive people more than anything. Yeah. I mean, you, you have, you yeah. have a certain energy. I mean, I'm so glad you're a teacher. I mean, you have a, you have a certain energy about you that, I mean, you can tell that your convictions, there, your enthusiasm's there. And I always love that. I ab yeah. absolutely love that. I wish more of the people that I talked to were like that because it would yeah. make it so yeah. much easier, but, but totally get it. Helping teachers, helping teachers become that is actually, this goes outside of our conversation, but like I teach yeah. science is weird. I am the owner and founder of science is weird, yeah. um, which is kind of redoing the whole um, third grade through eighth grade science curriculum. But like the larger project that that is nested in is this um, project of helping teachers uh not become like me. There are many different flavors of the sort of thing that I do, but engage, help them connect students what, to what they find most meaningful uh, oh. about whatever the topic is that they are teaching so they can naturally bring out whatever emotions they have with it. There you go. Mine is a very sort of peppy, tickery sort of approach, right? But other teachers right. may be more dry or maybe more deeper, whatever, quiet. Um, but like, like what... What matters for me is that things need to matter. Otherwise, I'm wasting kids' time. Okay. So it's, speaking of not wasting your time, um, the uh, what I here here's uh, a friend of mine. I texted her right before I came on to this, saying, "Okay, if I am anything but totally kind when you watch this recording, um, then I owe you twenty dollars." So you, Mark, should know that I come into this with this like noose tied around my neck or something like that. Oh, I, do, I don't. I don't. You won't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. I don't bring that out in people. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a quote you. really easily. There was a New Zealand journalist, and he was the only one that really captured it. And it's like, I didn't even know it. He goes, Mark has a goofy warmth that instantly disarms you. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. And I, and I, I asked my friends, I go, goofy warmth, goofy warmth. They go, yeah, holy <laughs> crap, that's it. <laughs> I go, oh, seriously, I've never had a journalist. I mean, I was so, I'll give you a real quick. When uh, when I did Piers Morgan, I was so nervous because it's like I've seen Piers Morgan, Morgan just destroy people, absolutely destroy people. He's a bitter, awful journalist most of the time when he finds your weakness. And by the end and at the end, he never took a shot at me. 
Not even once. And he's, uh, and he's like, well, you do you. And he never, uh, never once. I was like, wow. So that's my super. Wow. There you go. So here's how this is going to work. Yep. Um, you can, uh, you're, the, the, our plan is that for you to ask me one question, yeah. um, uh, put it as hard as you can of something that you'd like me to try to explain. Sure. I'm going to try to give an explanation for it. I'm going to try to not like falsely represent when I don't know something. Right. This is, none of this is my specialty. I've given some thoughts to your questions that you sent over. Then yeah. we'll exchange it and I'll do a question for you. You have, you asked me to, or you at least expressed that your preference was for me to not tell you what the questions were ahead of time because you wanted to be surprised. Yep. So just, so, uh, so I was, I was okay to, to do along with that, but, yeah, you, you know, my um, questions, so, especially feel free to say yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Which is totally unfair, but it is what you wanted no, no, no. to do yeah. for this. My intention in all of this is not to do any kind of gotchas. My, my hope my hope for like what this I hope, Mark, is like the beginning of a series of conversations that I get to have with people who are public intellectuals of topics of, of non mainstream opinions, sure. <laughs> because especially with science, there are so many things that people fight tooth and nail over. And those conversations. Are usually very bad, um, uh, and I, I want to be one of the people who is showing how to do these things really well. Which is not to say that I do them better than most people. I think I did them better than most people, but I don't. But I'm not at the top of my game, and I want to be at the top of my game. Okay, great. So one blah 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 blah. It's 13 minutes after the hour. Why don't you give the first question uh, to me right now, and then we'll set a timer. Okay. For 10 the minutes. the first the first question, which uh, I I, hope I don't have them memorized. The three that I gave you in order. Uh, the first one would be, and again, we'll, we'll stick with Apollo on, with the the moon program because it's easy, easiest for the people to relate and sure. uh, doing doing all the stuff here on the ground. I, I know what the answers are going to be, you know, like long distance photography or um, uh, horizon stuff or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so in the Apollo photos, uh, and there's a number of them, I just sent you one, but there's a number of, yeah. uh, number of them. Uh, if the sun is 93 million miles away, there you go. There's a shot. Yeah. Uh, the light source, which is really, 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 really far away, all mm -hmm. the the shadows should be running parallel. Okay. But yeah. in this in this photo, which is time and date stamp, this is straight from NASA. Mm -hmm. uh, these shadows are going to be intersecting. Do you have yeah. any? What what is your thoughts on this? On what is your yeah. reason why of why they might be intersecting? I'm not yeah. going to tell you mine, but but because you probably sure. know. But that's it. Sure. That's the first question. Sure. Um, so I so thank you for sending this ahead of time. I yep. looked at this uh, and I spent a bunch of time with this and I sent this to my science advisor yeah. and um, she sent something back to me that said, OK, I think I figured it out. And I I, I paused in reading her text. Okay. I just like went back to like look at it and I spent a few minutes on it. I could get nowhere <laughs> with it. It was a very enjoyable like what the heck is going on in this? Because. I take what you say, right? If the sun is really far away, if any kind of light surface is really far away, right. then lines should be roughly parallel. There's, a there's some complications we can talk about right. uh, with shading or fuzzing or whatever. Right. Okay, so um, the first answer that she came to was that she she took this picture. Yeah, I'm gonna like get my own mug off of here. Mm -hmm. Should he show you these pictures of these cans of these cans of beans um, here? And actually, you actually I, took these shots. Yeah, oh, she's a Lord. great okay. science advisor. I recommend okay. her to everybody except she's mine. Okay. Um, right. uh, so uh, already you can see that in here, these are, you know, converging now, not nearly as much right. as was in the Apollo picture. Mm -hmm. um, but what's going on here now, first of all, she does not have a light source that is infinitely far away with this. So this is of not course. exactly the same thing, right? God, I know. But I think that should almost in any way work from the opposite direction because one light bulb, two cans of beans, like that should make the shadows spread out, not come together. But already they're coming together here. So I saw this and I was like, wait, why would they be coming together? I, I still couldn't figure it out. Right. And then I kept reading what she wrote and I realized that this isn't, you can get lines that come together in a picture, in a photograph. Sure. Even when they're parallel in real life, like railroad tracks or a road, right? Going off into the distance. Right. They will always seem to come together. Now, there's a second part to this that explains, I think, why um, in that picture of the Apollo, uh, the Apollo mission, um, the lunar module lander was whatever um why they're so extremely coming together but i can pause on that i'm interested to hear your thoughts on 
this idea. That really they are parallel, but it's the perspective of being on a flat surface on a plane, the plane of the moon. Got um, it. That does. Got yeah. it. Um, and, and she is just so I, and you don't have to give me her name or anything, but she is a, just a science advisor in, in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amy Teagarden. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, um, she's actually she's helping my point more than she's hurting it. Yeah. Uh, one, of course, like, like you mentioned, the, the light source that she has is either in the kitchen or closer. It's sure. not an infinite light source, uh, sure. very, very far away. And sure. as far, but you're, you're right in terms of perspective. When you have mm -hmm. solid objects like railroad tracks, like power lines, like in fact, we use the railroad tracks quite often where we try to explain sure. to people that it's like, look, when something goes off into the distance, it's not, yeah. not only is it getting smaller depending on where, you know, but eventually it's going to, you know, shrink into nothingness at, at the, uh, at the horizon level. But uh -huh. to your point, mm -hmm. she's, she's creating something that doesn't exist on earth on the mm -hmm. nearby earth. Meaning when you go outside, remember the, the sun is mm -hmm. still 93 million miles away on earth and those shadows mm -hmm. don't react. The, the reason why we, we compare the Apollo shots to where we are right now is if you go outside mm -hmm. and you look at shadows in, a, in any sort of sunny situation, the shadows always run parallel, always, always, always. They mm -hmm. only start converging when the light source is either very close or very big, which it also means it's very close. For me, when I look at that shot, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what I'm looking at. I'm looking at studio lights, you know, stage lights, because whoever mm -hmm. set up the, the the photographs, again, bear with me for a second. We, if you mm -hmm. are setting up the beautiful yeah, yeah, yeah. Apollo shots, remember the, the Apollo moon video was very, very grainy and second generation, if you've ever heard mm -hmm. the stories of it, where the the the... The studio execs, like from NBC and ABC and CBS, were really upset because NASA wouldn't give them the direct feed. It's like, no, no, no. You have to come down here with your cameras and shoot our big screen. And it's like, what are you talking about? That second generation, it's going to look like crap, right? But yeah. whoever shot the still shots, you could tell were professional photographers. Pro professional photographers don't care about physics. All they care about is the light or is is about the the image itself. So they set up perfect lighting in just about every shot they could possibly come up with, which was a bank of lights behind them, which is why you have a hot spot on the ground and why all the, the shadows are intersecting. That's it. So you, I'm hearing you say, let me just repeat back some of what I'm hearing you say here. Yes. That on earth, when you take photos of shadows. Right. They will not be converging. Can't. Well, unless you're talking, again, shadows, when we're talking about close objects, like, I mean, yes, of course, shadows, it, if you're talking about very, very late uh, sun, you know, a uh, very late uh, sunset type settings, yes, the, the shadows depend on how long the shadow gets. But in this case, we've got objects that are very, very close to each other, and the shadows should be running parallel. Should be. And they're not. They're intersecting. So here, here is what I am imagining. You tell me if I'm wrong about this. Right. This is not the sort of thing that I'm very good at. Just to, like right. thinking in terms of three dimensions and whatever. So if you, so here, let's just, uh, so you have two cans, uh, two cans um, uh, um, up next to each other, kind of. And let's just imagine that like we're standing with a camera looking at these things. Right. And that let's also imagine that the, how do I say this? That... The sun is behind us, so the shadows right. can be cast forward in right. this. Um, now, if okay, yeah, here's how I want to say this. Oops. If you, what I think that you will see is that the shadows. Imagine these are kind of see through. I mean, then why are they casting shadows? I know, right? right. Whatever. And you can do this with trees all day long, by the way, while you're doing that. Ooh, sure, sure, why, sure, what sure. you're drawing there? Yeah, show me that in real life. Yeah. So Again, I, I, like, I know what you're trying to do there. Yeah, yeah. So I feel, so this is great. So I love that the challenge that you're throwing down here, right? Like this is something then now that I need to go and actually see if I can take photographs or find photographs of in real life or or whatever that do exactly this. So right. this is good. Like I am I'm good to your challenge and I okay. recognize that the only kind of proof for this is actually kind of proof for this. Right. I think that I can analytically prove this mm -hmm. though. <laughs> um, uh, but but we'll we'll see we'll see again. Uh, I I, I want to I want to just jump up uh, up for a second and and say one thing that might not be obvious to our listeners, right. which is that if you saw this from above, right now these are cans. I'm seeing just circles because they are right. because they are cans. Um, I totally agree that the shadow that they cast would be parallel. It's not precisely parallel. My apologies. That's right. 
but they're approximately parallel that paint, on there. By the way, are, what, which oh, it's a oh, it's a program called Procreate. It's uh, oh. so good. It's actually the reason that I got an iPad in the first place. The it, do you use this for your students quite a bit? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I run the whole business off yeah, of this. It's, uh, it's really, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's the it's the one thing in the world I'm good at. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay. So I would agree that, yeah, like you'd see these shadows parallel here. Yeah. Now I, the reason that I have a hunch that I can sort of prove that this is what you would see right. is that imagine that these shadows are cast on some, I don't, I'm not happy with that color. Imagine these shadows are actually cast on a train track. Right. So chugga 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 choo choo. Right. So we'd agree. I think we agree that if you saw this from overhead, right. the shadows be parallel. And if you put like the your a, a kid's train track or whatever right, be, right between that, right? Right. Or we could imagine you go to the train track and we put cans on either side, and the sun is right behind us, and so like the they they would be like that. Now, when you actually get down on the ground, right, and you look at this train track. As you said, the train track will appear to be converging off into the distance. Chugga chugga. Right. Uh, the, the physical, yes, the physical train yeah. track. Yeah, I see what you're trying yeah. to do that. You're trying to yeah. line up yeah. the, the shadows with the train track. My yeah. argument yeah. would be yeah. is that your, as I'm looking at the screen, I'm sure you're looking the same way, that right hand can shadow will be pointing to the right. So the, 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 the right hand can, the shadow will be identical to the left hand can. It'll be in terms of the, its angle. They, it's like the so the left hand can is pointing to let's say one o'clock. Sure, 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 sure. So one and two. So will the, so the right hand can, which is why then, again, I, and I'm not picking on your science advisor. No, 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 at no, no, all, no, no, no. But right, her, right. but when she jumps to an inside shot using soup mm -hmm. cans, it's like no, you can only do this with the sun. There is only one object, one light source you can ever compare this to, which is the sun. No other light source, no other light source can do this, which is why, again, if you were trying to fake this on the moon, mm -hmm. you, there's no way to simulate the sun. The closest you could do would to be, you know, to, to make a very, very small object really, really far, as far back at the stage as you can. And it's almost impossible to do. And I understand why they did it. In fact, they did this a number of times with different things, and most people didn't catch it. Why would you? The average person, as you know, you know, coming from the education world, uh, the 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 physics club and the math club very small, the band and the football team very big, which is why almost nobody got it. And the physics people would just dismiss it for the most part. It's like ah, it happens, kind of like the space suit, but we won't get into the space suit. Well, I don't think was that. No, that's, that's 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 one of your other questions. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, which we'll get to. Pause, which we'll yeah, we'll pause on that. Yeah. So let me just say that I love this because we are giving now contrary predictions, right? So anybody sure. right now can go out and actually try this, and I encourage everybody to make their own prediction as to which of these are right or whether it'll do some totally different thing, and then actually go out and look at this. Sure. If I can recommend, actually, like take your camera, your phone outside, and snap a photograph because. Human minds are really bad at making sense of how things look in 2D versus how things look in 3D. This is why in the Renaissance, when they actually like figured this out and hacked this with three-point perspective, it was such a revolution. Right. First people in, seemingly first people in history to actually figure out how to do that. But right. like if you take a picture of it, now the three-dimensional interpretation part of your brain is no longer thinking about it. You can just like sit back and look at the photograph and go, huh. And it is, you can, it is an object that you can think about. Um, so I recommend doing that. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. So I have, but I have one question for you in this, which is, I think, I feel like I don't understand how, oops, how it would be going like this, because it seems like we both agree that when the same situation is from above, that we well, agree but, that yeah, it should be it, parallel. It, it, well, well, that's just it. You're drawing them. I mean, that, mm -hmm. with the black, with the black shadows you have there, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've yeah. got the sun directly behind it. The mm -hmm. other one, you yeah. drew it like the sun would be little back and to the left. So, I guess my purpose in doing these pictures is that it's the same image, just taken from an above angle. And right. I should be really explicit here: above and um, from crouching down, right? Oh Here's, no, I got, I got you. Okay. And in fact, I would agree with this shot. And it's like, oh yeah, if. If the if the sun was directly, you know, we're, we're talking six o'clock compared mm -hmm. to this, then yes, the the shadows. And I know you, you don't have the shadows absolutely perfect, in because the, yeah, the yeah, drawing exactly. can only be so yeah. so linear. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, in which case the shadows are going to go the same direction. It was the second image which I disagreed with, which was I like, guess, 
if yeah. if, if the sun's coming at a certain angle and the shadow's firing off at one at one o'clock, then mm -hmm. the other one's going to be firing off at one o'clock. And again, we can see this with trees all day long. You can go into a yeah, forest yeah. with all sorts of vertical objects and all the shadows are going the same direction. Yeah, they totally will be. But will they look at it if you crouch down? What would the what would the crouching down make a? I, I, mean, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference in terms of, well, I mean, when you get down too far, you're not going to see the shadows at all. You're just not because yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. Be able to see them. But if so, you're standing at like just straight up six feet, give or take, wherever the camera is, uh, all the all the shadows will be pointing the same way. Again, one light source, one direction of shadows. Big light source or yeah. close light source, yeah. which, which goes into a, a side thing, which is the sticks and shadows argument, which I don't know if it was one of your questions, which is, um, to, is, it, is it or isn't it? Six of Chow's argument from from the the ancient times. Okay, perfect. Which is the people say, oh, the Six and Shadows argument, which which says that that because of the the way the the Six and Shadows are are set on the ground, it has to be a curved surface. I go, well, the Six and Shadows argument also where it's it's relative to the light source. Meaning, yes, if the sun is ninety three million miles away and it's a certain size, or if the sun is very very close and very very small, the shadows work the same. Meaning you could take a flashlight with uh, two little um, you know, pillars in a room and you could spin that flashlight around and then you realize it's like, oh yeah, the flashlight is really small and really close. So you can do all sorts of things with sticks and shadows. Anyway, that's a whole nother thing. And I, yeah, you know, no, you're listening, yeah. whoever, whoever's listening to this is probably, you're probably not getting this anyway. But No, because this, yeah, this is a part that's, it's hard to do. So um, let's just say that I... Your your prediction is going to be that they're going to intersect like a railroad track. Mine are going to say it's yeah, like, no, the yeah, shadows are going to go yeah. in the same direction because there's only one light source. There's another aspect of this about um, the specific photograph being a panorama, being a, comp a, a compilation. Oh, no, I, no, no, I do. Yes, of course. No, this is not a time lapse or any sort of stitch together from what I can tell. This is just a straight up Hasselblad shot. By the way, he didn't have a viewfinder on that, which also begs the question how did they get so many beautiful shots so i'm looking at this and i'm seeing frames a12 46 6, 7, 4, 6. there's a mouthful to oh. a12 46 6, 7, 5, 1, which means that i think right is meant well, to connect if, the if, different frames here unfortunately i don't know enough about cameras if they are stitched together first off they're it's a beautiful shot if they actually yeah. did it because i can't yeah. see where the, where the stitches are but I the think other... I found one like right in here, but it may be that the background is lumpy. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. I actually spent some time the, trying to figure the out other, what they did. The other thing that people suggested would be it's like, oh, it's a time lapse. It's like, no, okay. First off, they don't. They do no, no. nearly the time no, for a time lapse. Time. But yeah. if it was a shot, which is a you know, let me throw one more in there really fast, just long. Sure, sure. In the and the thing sure. is, why is there a hot spot directly in front yeah. of the? Uh, uh, the the guy that's supposedly taking the shot without a viewfinder, yeah. mind you. I've got to I've got to reinforce that he had sure. no viewfinder. He's shooting blind and getting these that. and then getting these wonderful shots. It's like yeah, oh. or the magazine guys. I just have really good cameras with viewfinders. So I can answer the question about the hotspot, kind of. Okay, <laughs> but it gets into weird kind of physics and optical things. But before I do that, yeah. um, the um, so one of the things that's interesting about a panoramic shot. Is that which it seems to say that it is because it says, says that it's a compilation of different frames. Okay. Um, so here's a, the same picture that we were looking at before, and here is one that Amy took <clears throat> using her phone's panoramic feature. Um, okay. And the interesting thing here is that you can see that these lines, like, really, kind of crazily go. Oh together. yeah, Ab absolutely. And yeah. I'm I'm right there with you. Have her try mm -hmm. that outside. <laughs> Meaning it's like, I, hey, I, I understand what you're doing there, but the light source is literally six feet behind her. And it's probably what, a 60 watt bulb or 75 watt bulb, or maybe she used a flash. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's yeah. like, look, I'm a little surprised that she would go to this. Like, no, no, you can't compare a, a, a kitchen light to the sun. It's it's six feet versus 93 million miles. And again, not my not my rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Her, yeah, yeah. It's, her, it's science rules. No, it's okay. Anyway. You, 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 can, you can inhabit my universe and I can inhabit yours. No, 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 it's, it's, really cool. this, this is something that we should be congratulating each other for. We I'm, should, I'm we should probably go to the to your question, though, because otherwise we're not going to get through these six. Sure, you're totally right. Um, if we ever come back to this, um, yeah. uh, I'll just say as a placeholder, um, it's not a question of what light source you're talking about from the way that I understand this. It's a yeah. question of when you take a panoramic picture, 
Yeah. What you're actually looking at. Actually, I took one in my office right before we started that yeah. does a whole 180 degrees. And in that situation, the lines of shadows will converge to exactly like horizontal at sure. each other, at least at the extremes. Sure. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I, I think that I think that what you're saying about the sun and the light bulbs is a different thing. Uh, I, um, but here, so but you're but you're right. Let's go on to the next okay. one. Okay. So yours so that, is your my first one. Okay, so my uh, first one is how can it be daytime in Seattle and Australia, but not in Europe? And I think you probably actually have a model where you can make sense of this, but I literally don't know what that model is because I haven't asked you before. And and I want to understand it. So let me just show this for the audience because I love this. You had pointed me toward this wonderful app and the guy who made this should be really congratulated on this. This is Flat Earth. Oh, right oh the here. Flat Earth Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock app. So good. Yeah. Well, they should um, be after the amount of time they've spent building it. I will be here. Let me give it five stars. Wait, I'm clicking on five stars. It's not taking it. That's all right. Four stars? That's weird. Okay. You I might have already rated it. Um, but why would it pop up again? Maybe that's maybe that's on him. Okay. So you can make this go. You can see that like, here's the model of where the sun is and the and the moon and Mars and Jupiter right. Right. is Saturn, Venus, um, which is so fantastic. I love this because it it is actually like a model, right? Like in the rationalist community, we have a saying, don't just exchange viewpoints, exchange models, right. like help each other explain, understand what model you are implicitly using to understand right. the universe. And this is like a model that is like, like anybody can download. It's a few dollars. Like I recommend anybody like buy this for a few dollars. It's beautiful. Yeah. And you can like look at it and like whatever your perspectives on these things are, you can say like, what, what does this mean? <laughs> Uh, if I think that this is wrong, why do I think this is wrong? What do I see in the sky that goes against this? Okay, so the first thing that I see here is like that there's this, that the sun makes it here. It makes it, um. what did I say? That Seattle and Australia. So I'll make right. it daytime in Seattle and Australia, but not in Europe. Tell okay. me like, why is that? Go for it. Okay. The the first thing, and <laughs> unfortunately, the one of the weaknesses of the flat earth map is we can't draw anything to scale. Okay. Uh, and so in this case, in fact, the in just about every flat earth map you can think of, the sun and the moon are drawn, you know, roughly the same size. In this case, I'm sure they're, they're exactly the same size. But we have to oversize them just so that you can see them at all. Because in our in our map, for example, uh, like, like you look at the sun there, it looks like it's about, uh, let's say, a thousand miles wide, give or take. Sure. Right. Sure. And the same sure. thing with the moon. Yeah. In our map. Mm. In, in in our reality map version, the sun is only 50 miles wide. Okay. So it's so small, it's it's what is that uh 90 something, 90% you know, smaller that you sure. would it would be barely a pixel. In fact, on a phone, sure. uh, it yeah. almost wouldn't be visible at all. So if one of the questions that, that comes up is like, why do we even have time zones if, if if the sun is wouldn't it light up everything? And it's like, no, it's just really, really small and uh, and very, very close. So instead of, uh, you know, 93 million miles away, it would be, say, give or take 3,000 miles. We're, we'll out as ballpark. We don't know for sure. But if the sun is very, very small and very, very close, then yes, the, the light is only going to reach so far. And don't forget that what we're breathing in is uh, is has a has a thickness to it. It also it's also tied to something which I hopefully isn't one of your questions is why can't we see Europe from the East Coast? Why can't we see Japan from California? And why can't we see Mount Everest from everywhere? And it's like well because the atmosphere has a thickness. You know it's eighty yeah, percent absolutely correct. Yeah, twenty percent. Yeah. But a lot of people don't know that. It's you'd be no. amazed. It's like it's like no, it compounds over distance. It's like look, like any scuba diver knows. Uh, oh yeah beautiful summer day you go down even 200 feet the sun is gone and you yeah. know whales disappear less than a few hundred yeah. yards uh off in the distance um same sort of thing here the sun if it's very yeah. very small yeah. and very very close there's only so far it's going to penetrate therefore there will be darkness in some places so it's a it's a very localized incandescent spotlight sure okay so that makes sense and i apologize it's potentially visually distracting in the background it's just you said that you know one of the one of the things about your model is that you know, the sun and moon or whatever are so ridiculously small. Well, and I realized, oh man, that's it. actually a problem that people have with like, with the standard model too. They think that they're about the same size because when we draw them on, I don't know, um, restaurant uh, uh, placemats, oh, right, right, like right, right, yeah. about the, the same size. Big by comparison, yeah. Yeah, but like space is empty in here. I'll just, um, I'll turn off the speed of light thing and I'll just, pretty empty out here. Like this is, uh, uh, if the moon were only one pixel, right. here comes our first planet and you get to... 
Mercury, and Mercury is just one pixel big. Right. <laughs> right. Because space in the standard model is really empty. Right. Uh, which, so no, which I, I just in itself I, it's confusing. Carl Sagan said that many times. He's going, it doesn't he goes, it seems like an awful waste if from yeah. a design standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can understand why um the ancients, like nobody grokked, you know, like the weird sizes of the universe, either in my our model uh, or your model. Right. Um here's the earth and here's the moon, right? Like this is really big, just recommended as a as right. a free thing online that people can look at. Okay, so I'm hearing your answer is that the sun is like a local spotlight. Can I just yes and something that you had said a minute ago, sure. which um, people don't appreciate that air is actually thick and like light cannot make it through all of it. That is totally correct. And uh, helping people see that and actually see the air is right. one of the, the big things of my job whenever I talk about atmospheric science. Yeah. Um, because uh, people look at mountains from a distance, I think going on a vacation to the mountain, you see that they're blue. And then you go to them and you're a little bit surprised in the back of your head that the mountains are not blue close up. Right. The reason for that is because you are, what you are seeing is the blueness is the blueness of the air right. that is between you and the mountain. People do not understand that air is literally blue. Yeah. Um, uh, we think it is clear because it's clear in small spaces. Sure. We think about water is clear when we see it in small spaces and we wonder, oh, why is it blue when it's in the ocean? It's because it's a little bit blue even when it's here. It's just you need to pile up a ton of it in order to see the blueness yeah. of it and the blueness gets in the way. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm hearing you say that the localized phenomenon, the localized kind of spotlight. Okay, so that part makes some sense. I, mean, I don't know. It makes lots of sense to me. Um, I took the map from that app um, and I put it on here. Yeah. Um, and what I feel like is that what then I would imagine this, uh, I want to actually undo that because I killed it. Let me do this actually. And then let me actually turn on, I made an equator here. Okay, so blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the sun, let's just imagine that the sun is going over the equator. You go to yeah. the equator, you look up in noon, and it's the solstice or whatever. I don't know. This all gets really complicated, which is why most people think that seasons are caused by something that seasons are not caused by the earth being farther away from the sun, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Um, so let's just take the simplest possible situation right here. Or, uh, sun is going over the equator like we, okay, like that. So if it's a simple spotlight, and I'm open to the idea that you're saying right. that it's not a simple spotlight, right. then like one of the things that we know is that, you know, if you go to, um, uh, uh, excuse me, um, uh, New Zealand, New Zealand is like three or four hours, depending on daylight savings, yeah. um, behind uh, Seattle. I used to live in Seattle, so and you live, live outside of Seattle, so we'll, we'll do Seattle there. Yeah. Um, so it's possible for um, the sun to be both in Seattle uh, it's sunny both in Seattle and in New Zealand. Sure. The sun goes like this. So like, right now it's here. Right now it's almost morning. It's night in New Zealand. It's night in New Zealand. It's night in New Zealand. Now it's a little bit of morning. And now it's noonish in New Zealand. And now it is sunset in New Zealand and whatever like that. Okay, cool, sure. cool, cool. Wonderful. If it's a spotlight that allows the sun to be, uh, to be sunny both in Seattle and in New Zealand. Right. It seems like you should always have some of, oh, I think maybe, crap, I think I actually ended up doing this wrong. You should always have some parts of the world that are uh, bright. Um, and here, I think the reason I screwed this up is because- No, no, it's okay. It, I, I, the, the spot of the circle should be bigger because it's only three hours ahead. So it's something like this. And here, after all of my work in doing this, I, I, I fear that I have now- Undid. No, 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 it's okay. My my response as you're yeah, doing yeah, yeah. this, just, it, so, just so you don't spend too much time on this, is yeah, that um, we don't know. I mean, yeah, I say it's a, it's a spotlight, but it could, <laughs> as far as the, the directional qualities of the, mm -hmm. the spotlight, we have no idea. You know, which is why when you when you showed me the the day night thing from the, from our app, you know, yeah, it yeah. didn't look didn't look perfectly spherical. I don't know that I have, believe it or not, I have I have not seen this uh, the day sun thing like this before you know so how, how he's yeah. got it set up so how they've got in this case they have it set up as a directional spotlight because you've seen it's a it's like a crescent that's going around at all time it yeah. looks like a crescent moon in blue yeah I, I don't i don't know in fact i've got i've got a funny feeling they kind of took some guesses when when they made this as well uh yeah. although maybe you know i'm sure they said oh no it's light here and it's light here so there that's how we built this uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But, yeah, but but when you were building your thing, you were building it with a you know with a perfect you know circle circle spread, which you should mm -hmm. do in, in most light sources. 
<laughs> why they've got it like this, I don't know. You're probably gonna, I, you know, I could put you in touch with David Wise, and you guys can talk about well, exactly how he built it. But like the reason that, like, the, this makes perfect sense to me that they do it in this crescent crescent fashion, because exactly as you said, this like one of the things that we do know is where it is day and night. Right. Like you can call, you know, you can call your friend, like when you know, in South Africa, in Australia, in wherever, and say. Tell me, like, either what time is it right there, or right. like, is, is the sun light? out? Is it noon right now? Right. So that's something that because we have instantaneous technology, uh, communication technology, we can we can know that beyond the shadow of any doubt. Right. And so you like we know where the we know where the shadow is. Right. And this matches it perfectly. Oh, good. Um, in fact, I think he has even done more than that. Like, I think he has actually built the seasons into this um it really is like this is an amazing work of art this is the sort of thing that like the medievals were trying to do when they yeah. had their little astrolabes or whatever like this is like maybe the coolest astrolabe that the world has ever seen at least that i know about and everybody should get this like three dollars what right. are you spending three dollars on that you do you this is to bring you more than three dollars worth of joy okay right. um so you're saying that like you don't know that like i don't know um it seems like it has to be the shadow because the shadow is the shadow of where it is night. Yeah, yeah. If, and right. if that's the shadow, then that's the shadow. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't see any problem with it because if he's basing it off, okay, when where it's it's unusual to me. But then yeah. again, you know, yeah. it's like we don't know the pro. There's so much we don't know about this. Again, we've only been doing this eight years or so. So what what exactly the properties are? I'm mean, yeah. yeah. We don't yeah. even know exactly what the sun is now. You know, if it's so close and uh, and uh, and so small, we don't exactly know what it's even powering powering it at this point. You know, is it is it actually a giant ball of fusion? One of the things that I appreciate most about yeah. um, anybody who is willing to think outside of the usual, not just scientific, but like the usual box on anything, is that if they're right, right, um, then there are all sorts of new things to explore and to understand. Sure. <laughs> so this is, this is, I think, just a yes and <laughs> toward what you're saying. Mm. If it is true, right, that like we don't, that this is the true model, yes, and uh, yes, um, then we have something really major to explain as to how the sun could cast a shadow like this. And note that sure. the shadow is weird and that like the bottom of Antarctica here, I'm sorry, let me do that right here, but the top of Antarctica, yeah is actually not in shadow <laughs> right here the right hand side of antarctica oh, i'm sorry um it's weird on my thing it's shifted around oh no it's okay. this. um the um yeah the top now here now the top of antarctica is not in shadow right the right hand side of antarctica the very tip of it is not in shadow like right. what is causing the light to appear as far away as that mm -hmm. but not in that big blackish spot yep. in the middle so like this is my challenge to anybody in the flat earth community is that my goodness, like if you are right about this, like I want to know about this because right. there's, like, I'm an intellectual thrill junkie. I want to find new things, sure. <laughs> uh, which is part of why I've been excited to uh, to, to engage in all of this. Sure. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Your oh, turn. Okay, uh, second question real fast because I, I I know we're, we're kind of dragging these. Uh, real quick on the Apollo shot, same shot, because that way we can yeah. just stay yeah. on the same shot. There is no blast crater underneath the, uh, yeah. the thrust nozzle of the, the lander. And people have been talking about this actually ever since 1972, you know, ever since the, the the moon missions finished, which is like, okay, if there is thrust, if you're landing on this thing and this big giant 10,000 foot pounds of thrust hits, why is it? And of course, the secondary question is there's, it, you know, again, stagecraft, which is why is there pretty much what we could tell four inches of ash, even four <laughs> inches of ash, no matter where you go. And why isn't that four inches of ash? that you know the the astronauts are walking on why isn't that even displaced in the slightest at no point for example did the astronauts grab a shovel and start digging to the point where they got rock because the ash can't go on forever and nor can you step in an infinite pile of ash if the ash is six feet th thick you know it's going to be like snow eventually or it's or it's pecked down really really hard but either way that blast um that thrust didn't displace any of it and even the norm real quick uh, on a side note uh, Norman Rockwell, when he was asked to draw the lander on the moon before it got to the moon, he drew exactly what he thought it would be, which is there would be this massive splay pattern, a burn pattern, and there, yeah. this thing would be landing on rock. It wouldn't be landing on ash. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. What happened? So this is really cool because I didn't know about this at all, right? This this objection. And so I got to go off like into this internet rabbit hole, okay. <laughs> like looking at this, which is 
and I'm not speaking so much to you here as to everyone who's listening to us, another really fantastic thing about going into, um, you know, what are derisively referred to as conspiracy theories, which sometimes may or may not actually determine that, but like any kind of unpopular, like, ooh, like icky sort of, I don't like this, it's not mainstream. One of the most wonderful things about this is that you end up as you engage in this, learning all sorts of amazing details about things that you never, ever would have had any interest in in the first place. Sure. But because they become useful tools and like answering this bigger question, they're suddenly really cool. Okay. So when we imagine, so I, I'll, I, this, I need to say that like the, this answer that I'm giving, like, I don't know anything about anything. Right. <laughs> um, um, I, uh, I play a science teacher on the internet. Right. Did I take a picture of this? I think I didn't. That's fine. Um, uh, so take everything that I say with a grain of salt. I did have Amy look at this, um, but this is not her specialty. She's a cell biologist, um, by, by her training is, um, uh, but you know, she's like a science geek and she's really great with, uh, metrics and, uh, and, and math and things of this nature. Okay. So there's a couple things that come together, um, for this and the usual explanation of why there is no at least not a sizable, just like easily discernible blast blast crater there. If you told me, Mark, that like, Brandon, I think I see a blast crater there. I, I think I'd actually believe you, but like, I'm, I'm not saying that I can see, no, it's a bit different color on this. I don't know. It's kind of brownish around here or something. It's just Maybe that's really reflection from the foil though. I don't know. I don't know, right? Like just, yeah, I'm agreeing with you that it's not like an obvious discernible one. Right. Okay, a couple different things. Um, when I imagine uh, a, um, a big crater from a rocket going off. First of all, one of the things that I'm imagining is like the space shuttle going off or like the Saturn V rocket right. going off. Um, big hulking things. But when we are talking about my son built this, he did not build it for the purpose of this, but my gosh, it works well for it. If you take this part off, yeah. you take, ah, uh, I need to take that part off. Yeah. Take this part off yep. and then, nope, sorry. It's, ah, I'm so sorry, James. That's okay. Oh my gosh. No, not you. Just, oh, your son? I just broke. I just broke his Legos. Well, it will So inside he'll, of here. He'll be scarred. Is, is this thing. Right. So when we imagine rockets going up, we right. need to lift this entire thing, which I can tell you, even in Lego form, is fairly hefty. Right. Um, but this is a heck of a lot less. So this has a rocket on the bottom of it, which I, you know, just inconveniently broke off right here by accident, but there's That's a little okay. rocket I, on the I'm on the sure he'll forgive you. Yeah. Um, uh, but you're not lifting nearly as much weight. That's one of the things for that. Uh, looking at the um, uh, the specs on the rocket that they had attached to there, you're yeah. talking about something that is within, like, it's it's about as much as a Harrier jet. Um, a Harrier jet, even at full throttle, right? Now, I've not seen a Harrier jet like taking off on grass or whatever and like looked at the grass afterwards. Yeah. But I would not imagine that a Harrier jet would like knock away all of the dirt, <laughs> um, uh, rip up all of the grass on that. But I don't know that. And maybe you know more about that, that than I do. But there's another aspect of this, which I thought was really cool. Oh, sorry. One of the aspects of it was um, that they, um, uh, now this is according to the story, right? And story should always be taken with a grain of truth. Yep. But when they were landing this little booger on the uh, on the, on the ground, they didn't want to go really fast, really fast, really fast, and then suddenly hard breaks. Right. That's super dangerous. But also, and I thought this was really cool, if they did that, they knew there was dust on the moon. Um, right. And um, and if they, you know you, you shoot down gas down, it's going to hit dust. That dust is going to hit you back up. Yeah, they were in danger of actually damaging the lunar module sure. um, if they did that. So they wanted to slow it down way the heck ahead of time to make a really gentle landing. So we should expect from that that they would then not have the whole thing on maximum power. Um, so that's another aspect of it. But then the third and coolest aspect of this, Mark, that I found yeah. out is that when I imagine a rocket, I'm always imagining a rocket in air. But as you were saying before, air is this thick stuff. Right. When a rocket is taking off on Earth, um, it has the, uh, the gas going down below it. Right. And it's like the rest of the air is holding it in place there. So there's that really hot gas. It spends a lot longer on the ground than would otherwise than than it would otherwise on the right. moon with virtually no atmosphere depending on how you define atmosphere kind of right. does or kind of doesn't or does it in the daytime 
but not at nighttime. It's really weird. Um, but um, uh, but there's like they shoot the gas down, and those little atoms of gas go pink, and they bounce away, right. and they spend the barest time actually on the ground. So even after all of everything we've talked about, we should right. expect to have less of a crater. Oh, also the moon has basically no gravity, right? The moon has one sixth of the gravity. Right. And so it weighs, like this even weighs one sixth as much as it looks like it should weigh compared to this. Good, there we go, four points and done. What are your thoughts on any of that? I, and I've I have heard some some of that before uh, the the basically no thrust argument which is like well there really wasn't that much much thrust to begin with and my argument mm -hmm. there we'll we'll combine a couple of things and we'll we'll sure. move on to to questions the other questions because I I don't want to spend too much on this rebuttal which is uh you, two real quick ones you could go to the beach and you don't even need a straw you could just use your mouth you could blow into the sand. Mm -hmm the lightest breath and you will be able to move sand mm. and that sand will mm. look different from the sand around you or if you don't want to go mm. to the beach you can go to your kitchen take some flour put it on the counter and you can blow on it again you don't need a straw again that's just you with a little puff of air and you could blow a crater in that flower yeah. which will look different from the from the flower around it yeah uh, but to your point with one sixth earth gravity again how did they determine that before they got there i have no idea but it doesn't really matter which is um that that would mean the ash weighs even less. So whatever downward force hits it is going to, there's going to be some spread. There is going to be a splay pattern. I'm sorry, that nozzle is ridiculously huge. You can't tell me by the time it got, yes, and I understand. It's like, you you know, you slow down gradually, gradually, gradually. And by the time you get there though, there's still going to be some thrust. Even if you minimize it beyond expectations, there's going to be a splay pattern. It's going to, at the very least, look different than the ash around it. And I know you can try to draw a, a picture and, and convince yourself that it does look different, but come on, we've had people look at those all sorts of different angles. It's like, no, they said it there. If you believe in stagecraft, it was something that was overlooked, which was when they were putting everything together, it's like, hey, maybe we should have a splay pattern. And then somebody just, it was just oversight. Stagecraft oversight, that's all it was. And I tell you that I really appreciate you bringing up that um, the, I mean, really, honestly, both of those things. <laughs> I had not been thinking about how a straw or my mouth, right, can blow um, dust uh, away. Sure. From each other. That's, that's really, really good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then compounding that with the less gravity should mean that it goes more easily. That really feels right to me. I'd have to think this through more, but that feels absolutely correct to me. Thank you for expanding oh, no, my no worries. Love Look, this uh, movie movie production techniques are, is one of my one of my specialties, one of my, my guilty pleasures. And I have looked at way too production mistakes. W w again, not not NASA, but just movies in general. I, I talk about it all the time. It's like, look, things yeah. get slipped by all the time. The the very first Lord of the Rings, uh, when they were leaving the Shire, there was a car that was driving off in the distance. Really? Yeah, oh, I got a white car, and it actually made it into the theater. So I was like, do you know how many people had to have watched all the versions of the prints? And then it gets to the theater because everyone was focusing on the hobbits. And then all of a sudden, yeah. one guy who yeah. wasn't looking was like looking down at his popcorn, looks up, it's like, hey, why is there a <laughs> car up there? And they had to oh. they had to re splice it and re they had to release new prints to to get out to the theaters. And again, that's a major motion picture. Okay, uh, oh, your well, I have one interesting thing to say about about uh, that, but it doesn't it doesn't take me to uh, it doesn't overturn what you've just said. Hmm. Um, and that is that the sp one of the things that um, looking into this caused me to realize that I had no idea why there was dust on the moon. I've always wondered <laughs> this, and I and I'd never looked it up before. Right. Um, and so the theory on this is that um, uh, most of the moon is actually um, ridiculously rocky, terribly rocky, horribly rocky sorts of areas. Um, uh, they landed in the uh, on the moon right. It looks like a rabbit eating a bowl of porridge yeah. um, uh, near the rabbit's head, near the rabbit's ears, if I'm remembering that correctly. Sea of tranquility. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and they did that um, because the rabbit, the, the dark splotches that you see on the moon are actually magma, right? They're cooled lava. Sure. Um, uh, the moon is actually still maybe a little bit volcanic. Um, uh, it hasn't gone off in a long time, though. Uh, but at one point, like, that was glowing red lava. <laughs> and then it cooled very quickly. Um, and then, but if you looked at, would have looked at it, it would have looked so flipping awesome. Right. Um, and that is why it is really flat there, weirdly flat on those parts of the moon, though not most of the moon. Um, and then why then is that, are they covered with, why is that covered with dust? And the answer is that these little micrometeorites right. hit 
the ground right over millions and billions of years. Yeah. Um, and they just they they hit it a little bit and they go right. The moon is essentially all craters, <laughs> even like the parts that look like they're not just they're micro craters because they have no atmosphere to sure. to burn that stuff up ahead of time. Yeah. Um, and so that's where the dust comes from. Now, when that because that dust is like that, um, because it's essentially fresh. It's volcanic, uh, not ash. Um, it's volcanic. Um, there's a word for it. It's glass. Certainly looks um, like ash, by the way. Well, but if you look at it under a microscope, right? Like it is, it's glass because volcanoes shoot out glass. Right, right, right. right. A, 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 a technical word for that, yeah. but um, but like that's why it's so sharp. If you're cut by an obsidian blade or yeah. something like that, you can really do some damage. Planes can't fly through it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you inhale it, right, like it actually rips up your oh, lungs. Oh, yeah, that's real um, bad. So because of that, you can imagine those as the dust is actually made up of zillions of really tiny blades. Yeah. And I can actually imagine those, but this is just an imagination thing, being stuck harder together yeah. than any sand on earth could possibly be because the sand that we have on beaches has actually been through all of the cycles of erosion right. where they are not little bespoke, weird, wonky knives that are interlocking with one another. Yeah. Um, but they are, you know, basically cubes or kind of globules of stuff. Um, so I think that maybe like you could blow sand here um, uh, and it would go away from each other where um, if you were blowing moon sand, even if you're blowing moon sand here, right. um, it would be locked together more. But this is an imagination thing. Sure, I'm not sure. an no, astronomer. So this is, yeah. So thank you for this. No, no. All right. What's your second question? How, um, let me give you one that you, let me give you one that you don't know. So you can end on one that you do know. Okay. Um, why are hurricanes afraid of the equator? <laughs> Have you heard that one before? I was yeah, hoping that no, you no, would. No, no, I've, I've, I've heard of, I've heard of this. Dang one it! No, 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 it's okay. Come Dang on. it! I've Here's the picture this, that I got. I've been for doing this. this. I've been doing this for eight years. So Indeed. no, I've, I've heard of it. Indeed. Uh, is, and the the question is, uh, hurricanes versus cyclones, if I'm not mistaken. Hurricanes. Uh, go I think they're called cyclones when they're in a certain part of the world, and they're called hurricanes. They're called typhoons. And oh, different exactly. Parts. Giant storms, big, big oceany storms. But but the better, here. but the better question. I don't know if you had a follow up to it. Was why do hurricanes go in one direction and cyclones go in another? Another, oh, we can know. totally talk about that too. Clockwise, um, why? I have no idea. Sure. Clockwise I versus think, yeah, oh, clockwise. yeah, I can I can explain that. And I, I'm actually set up to explain if you want. I had to figure this out when I taught a class called Wind is Weird sure. a couple of years ago, which was so hard. Yeah. <laughs> but like I can actually walk you through what I learned from it, and it all makes sense, and it's beautiful. Right. Um uh, and that was actually maybe gonna be one of my questions for you, but it got really complicated. But can I first ask you? In fact, I can. No, I, I want to ask. I want to ask why, you. The, why, is, why are hurricanes afraid of the equator? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. I, I haven't gotten that question. You're absolutely right. You, yes! you gold, gold star, gold Thank star. Thank you very much. Gold star. Amy, By the way, and I've never, nice I've never, I've never seen this projection. And my answer would be because I've never seen it before in my life. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. I, I don't, I yeah. don't have, I don't have yeah. any idea. Does that does that prove the globe? Not necessarily, no, but no, uh, no. I don't, I don't think it hurts us either. I mean, in fact, I'm sure you've seen the 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 weather part of uh, our app. I have so, not. Oh yeah, you should no. you should find it if you get a chance. The the weather like the jet streams work so much more naturally. They look so much more. I shouldn't say what because that's an assumption. They look so much more natural on the uh, on the flat Earth map than they than they do on the globe. They just travel in this these cool circular patterns, perfectly circular patterns in most cases. Now, as far as, but that's, that's a great map, by the way, where it's like, okay, you're absolutely right. For whatever reason, hurricanes do not spawn on the equator. That's a good one. And not only spawning. Um, so uh, I mean, Amy I mean I... I'm looking just like, there's a, yeah. there's, there's almost a drop dead zone where you get to a certain yeah. point where it's like, whether it's a typhoon or a hurricane, they, uh, they do not like the equator at all. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that even when they like wander close to the equator, they die. Right. So to give the to give the explanation for why this is on the globe model. Sure. Um, I think I need to explain why they turn, why they are clockwise in one hemisphere and counterclockwise in the other hemisphere, which if you want right now, I can take a crack at that. And then if I do a bad job of it, you can ask some questions and then I'll, you know. Well, no, no, no. I, I, I believe what whatever, you know globular globalist uh, uh explanation you come up with I, i'm sure it's great i just know if we have time i think you're probably right about that um i guess the shorthand of it is that they go clockwise in the southern hemisphere so typhoons sure sure yeah and um, then hurricanes are counterclockwise yeah my whole scientific teaching career is based on like uh, like ignore finicky terminological distinctions 
whenever we can well, combine no, things. I mean, so cyclones, I... Are, cyclones are kind of a, they're not used very much compared to, I mean, it's like an 80, 20 thing. People like never say type or cyclones or no, wait, because I'm, Americans no, I'm, are, I, wait, I'm using Americans only type, care about these typhoons. Right? No, that's wind. That's just straight up wind. Cyclones versus hurricanes, right? Typhoon is I think a typhoon is the third one. I think one of them is used in only in uh, India. I think it might be typhoons in India. <laughs> cyclones only India. here, and they're just it, words, right? Huracan was a uh, Mayan goddess of destruction, um, and so we named them after her. Not not my. It was Mayan. It came to Haiti, I think. Okay, blah blah blah. Okay, so basically they go in one direction um, because of the spin of the Earth is the globe sort of theory on this, and I can I think I can explain why that. That is, but then if they're going in one direction because of where they are go where they are in uh, on the globe, when they cross into the other one, then they start spinning in the other direction. Well, uh -huh. when they stop spinning, then they die <laughs> because sure. it is the nature of one of these things to actually need to actually spin. Um, the short version of this, and I could walk through this more in the future, is that you need to understand um, that when you have a hot place next to a cold place, right. wind will hop from the hot place up because heat rises is the easy way. I hate that phrase, actually, because it misses what's really going on. But you can say heat rises, but then it has to fall because there's a vacuum down here. And so it makes this circle where usually if you're by the beach, um, all things being equal and all things are never exactly equal, right. um, the wind is coming towards you. We call this the sea breeze. Oh. And um, by the equator, it is warmer. So that means that the natural thing is for the um, the air to be going up over here, up from the hot part, falling down at the cold part, and then coming back. So on Earth, if everything was very simple, and it turns out that it can't be because right. the Earth is spinning, right. um, that uh, that you should expect to have wind blowing from the, the poles to the equator. Now, that's not what we actually see. And then this gets confusing. Um, what we actually see uh, is that in certain spots, you have wind going to the east or to the west or to the east or to the west or to the east or to the west. Explain why that is, is the sort of thing that I can do, although it requires going through the other parts of this. This is called the Coriolis effect. And it uh, is, I have never succeeded at finding online an actual explanation for the Coriolis effect. Well, so I made one. <laughs> so if you were interested, if anyone in your community would like, I'd be delighted to give you guys um, uh, um, uh, uh, privileged access to this one like hour and 20 minute long epic lesson that I did that just asks like, why does the wind in North America go for most most of the time from west to east? Where I walk them through this, be happy to do that for for free or whatever. Um, and then you can you can understand it in the Coriolis. What we call the Coriolis effect actually ends up being a perceived fake effect. It's an illusion <laughs> caused by the Earth's spinning. This is the globe model. I have yeah. no idea how you guys explain this, uh, but maybe somebody in the community has come up with this. And then I would actually love to hear what that explanation is. I think that'd be really interesting. Um, but the trick of it is that if you imagine that your job was to stand in Florida and hunt polar bears, right? the polar bears are very far away. <laughs> yeah, Here they are. Uh, that's a really bad polar bear. Okay. Sometimes I'm better at drawing polar bears than this. Yeah. You shoot them, you see them right from a really long distance away right. and you shoot straight north right. at them. Um, what you will find happens is that you never hit the polar bear. By the time that your bullet gets there, it will always seem to be uh, hitting to the right of them or to the, never, the east right. of them. Um, so the, it looks to you like for whatever reason, the bullets veer off. The truth of the matter is that that is an illusion. The bullets are going perfectly. The bullets are going perfectly straight. It's the fact that the polar bear is moving to the left right. that is the problem. There, hold on. Did I say that right? Now I'm actually afraid that That's I it. said That's that okay. wrong. Okay, yeah, no, no, I said it right because. Nope, the polar bear is not going to the left. Oh God, this is why this is so flipping confusing. That, that's okay. Everybody is going to the right. Yes, at this because. The Earth spins toward the east, and that is why the sun seems to rise in the east in the globe model of this. Of course. The trouble is that at the equator, you're going a thousand miles an hour. Yes. At the poles, you're going exactly zero miles an hour. Right. Um, I remember once when I was flying between Minnesota and Seattle, actually, um, the sun was setting and the sun stayed setting for the entirety of our plane flight. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I think I just figured out about how fast 
the uh, the Earth is spinning at this latitude. It's going about like 700 or 800 miles an hour or something sure. like that, which turns out to be about true. So when you are in Florida, you are going 800 miles an hour to the east. When you are in you know the bottom of Alaska right here, the Arctic, Arctic Circle or whatever this is, a 30-degree line, um, you're going only about 500 miles an hour to the east. If you were to teleport from one spot to another, you would actually have a massive problem in that because you'd be going... 400 miles an hour, faster or slower in one direction. Right. You'd kill yourself and everybody around you or in one direction of you. Right. Um, uh, uh, so when you shoot the bullet, your bullet is going at 900 miles an hour to the east and it right. never loses that trajectory given Newton's laws. But um, as it comes closer and closer to the Arctic Circle, the Arctic Circle or the polar bears up there are going not as fast that direction. So it misses them and goes to the right. I try actually at one point to explain this better given this picture, where if you imagine going from a really long distance and doing this shooting effect right, at right, uh, right. each other, the X person is trying to shoot the expert. Uh, I should have given them different letters. Um, they're trying to shoot each other. In fact, from their perspectives, each of their perspectives, their bullets will always veer to the right on each other. Yeah. I know this is actually debated as to whether this is a relevant thing in snipers, um, I do have no idea whether this is relevant or not for the small enough space for snipers. Even that's a fairly. Oh, I, I can tell you, I've I've done years worth on this. Sure, I bet, I bet. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Well, well, I was about to say the um uh, again. I'm not trying to burst your bubble in any way. The great yeah. explanations, but I love the drawings. Uh, real quick though, the um because uh, I led you down the the wrong path in terms of of. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Terms. That's right. Uh, hurricane and typhoon. Those are the opposites. They're both considered cyclones. Okay. So typhoon, that sounds right you're absolutely right. Yeah, typhoon is based on location. They go, the only difference between a hurricane and a, and, and a typhoon is location, and they're both considered cyclones. Okay. Sure. Um, as That's far the, as the Coriolis yes. effect, well, I can tell you, one, I shoot. Uh, and uh, sure, sure. when it comes to... When it comes to snipers, yes, every mm -hmm. once in a while you'll see a news story that that says, oh, yeah, the sniper had to take in, into account the Coriolis effect and the curvature mm -hmm. of the Earth. I'm going, wow, that's interesting because I've never actually seen a scope, and I've seen a lot of scopes over the years that actually they have windage and elevation. They do not have curvature, and they don't have the Coriolis effect. And when you get the, – the bigger thing is when you get to the much, much longer distances, like shooting a polar bear from Florida, for example, yeah. or, or wherever you were shooting from. Yeah. No military – It's legal in Florida, so, yeah. Well, there you go. Everything's legal. With, and with, no matter no matter what you're shooting, and I have I've been, I've got all all these guys on video, uh, everything from howitzers to uh, long range missiles to to naval guns, the the whole nine yards. No one ever takes into account either the curvature of the Earth or the Coriolis effect. They go, oh no no, we've heard of it, we've seen the tables, we don't use it. In fact, I've got I've got a, a master gunner from the army who says he goes, you know how difficult war would be. If we had to take into this account, because let's say, you know, you're a tank, you're run, you're going through the desert, right? Then your your guns were geared for, you know, a, a certain latitude or longitude. And all of a sudden you go to it. It's like now we have to look at the map and we have to figure out exactly how fast the earth is spinning for, for it to take the shot. No, we just take the freaking shot. He goes, he goes, it works out every every time. It's It's not there again. They've all heard about it, but they never put it into effect into the firing solution. And okay. uh, I always thought that was interesting. It's like, oh, yeah, the, again, the Coriolis effect from the science book standpoint. Oh, yeah, it's there all day long. And, and the explanations I like, sure. But from a practical sense, it's not used, which I also find very, very interesting. So this is a question of fact. And I'm willing to believe you um, on this. Um, I would love to know. I would love to see some. Oh, sources. dude, there's a. I was, I'm, I'm, both, a, both, I'm a both of what we're saying. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Third question. That is, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. That's good. Okay, uh, so your turn. My, your my turn. turn. Third question, uh, you know it, which is yeah. thermal dynamics, which is uh, uh, pressure cannot exist to, next to non-pressure without a barrier. Plain and simple, right? You, If you go to the store <laughs> and you want to pick up some propane, you always take a tank with you. It's like, you know, get pick me some propane from the store, but don't use a tank. Can't be done, right? Yeah, exactly. You're not going to use your hands. So that being said, everything, and you know, it's not our videos, everything in a vacuum chamber expands, expands, expands if it's pressurized at all and explodes. I don't care if it's a football, I don't care if it's a can of soda, I don't care if it's a Stretch Armstrong, I know that dates me a little bit. You know, any any sort of pressurized system at all. Stretch Armstrong, nuts to you. <laughs> will will expand and then detonate. There's only one thing ever that didn't do this at all. And, I, and again, it's pure genius how they got away with it, and that is the spacesuit. The question isn't there yet. The early spacesuits were done, with, and again, you can look this up with videos. The early spacesuits that were designed in the, the mid-1950s were all heavy plastic and metal. 
super <laughs> bulky because they knew this. It's like, no, you have to use something that's rigid against some sort of, if you're in a pressurized situation, look up on, on YouTube all day long, uh, vacuum <laughs> versus steel rail car. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. You know, you apply the vacuum field to the inside of a steel rail car and it collapses like Godzilla just bit it instantly. It's violent. It's it's horrifying. And um, there's only one object that, that doesn't do it. And that's uh, that's the soft NASA spacesuit. And again, it's brilliant in that. And so the question is, mm -hmm. what? And I, I can't, I know there's a problem here because I can't even come up with a fictional and I'm a pretty good writer sometimes. I can't even come up with a fictional way of how this works. What in that backpack, remember they weren't tethered. What in that mythical backpack of theirs, I don't care about heating and cooling and oxygen and CO2 and all that, although it does bring into question where they got all the nitrogen from, but who cares? Mm -hmm. What in that backpack stops that spacesuit from expanding to the point where it turns into a parade float and then it bursts and then they tip over and die? So this is cool because I don't, know very much about uh, space boots. I mean, I looked up some things on this, but I haven't seen like schematics or whatever. Sure. But I feel like if I, I imagine that if I gave a bunch of PhDs and, engin and engineers a bunch of money mm -hmm. to, I don't know, like bring, like put a bag in a vacuum chamber and have the bag not blow up. It's never been done. In fact, well, we're, real quick before you, before you even try to yeah, answer this, sure. um, I yeah. this this is this is an old one for me, and it's a stickler because I put this challenge out there for the last five years to okay. the, where I said, I go look, I go, I'm so confident in this, I go, loan me a freaking spacesuit, put me in any sort of vacuum chamber in any university, pull the switch, mm -hmm. tell me how I don't die. Because I've seen what happens in a vacuum chamber. And not only that, because like you said, you, you know, one of your difficulties is proving that that atmosphere is actually r real, right? It, you know, it, it looks the same as a vacuum chamber. I go yeah. for $4, I could prove that it's a vacuum chamber or not. You can't just put me in a chamber and pull a lever. It's like, well, you're in a vacuum now, right? You can't, because it's like, oh, really? Because tap water boils in a vacuum. I go mm -hmm. and in a balloon mm -hmm. with a single breath of air, yeah. we'll, we'll blow up yeah. until, it, until it detonates. And not only that, the one you probably already know, which because you may have done it in your classroom, I go, I'll just bring a st stupid bell, stupid little brass bell. Brass bell won't make a sound in a vacuum chamber. Yeah. So I can prove it's a vacuum chamber with $4. Sure. sure. Point is, why doesn't that single breath of balloon apply to a soft suit? And the reason why they got away with it, and again, you can you can try to explain it, which is uh -huh. it's stagecraft, which is someone at NASA was so brilliant. They said, no one's going to figure it. No one's going to know this. They're not going to, most of the general population aren't going to, all we have to do is show it on television. That's all we have to do. No one will figure it out. In fact, the physics people won't even, won't even question it. I have asked physics people all day long. They'll, they, so, they've come up so far person. as to say like lower pressure. That's the best they can come up with. I'm not like a physics a, person, but I, but I feel like I have a good enough grasp of the basics of physics to yeah. say that like, I'm, I'm actually confused as to why, like how this would be an insurmountable problem. Um, let me just start off with an easy thing. Like, could sure. you put a brick in a vacuum chamber and have it not explode? Yes, as long yeah. as there's not an air pocket in the middle of it, but yes. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, if you had an air pocket in the middle of a giant rock, right? why would that explode? No, that, that wouldn't explode, but that's why they make, if, you, if you've ever looked it up, why university vacuum chambers are reinforced so incredibly heavily on the outside yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with concrete because of the pressure difference. Yeah. A vacuum is no joke, as you know. Vacuum, yeah, by yeah. the way, we'll, we'll, that's a whole other question which we won't get into, which is why is our atmosphere still here? Because you'll say gravity. But it's like, no, vacuum, the power of a vacuum, and if I'm using the term wrong, forgive me, power of vacuum defeats everything. It absolutely cannot be beaten. So, yeah. Except for maybe Got a black... It black hole but that's a whole nother got it thing i think that i think that your understanding of a vacuum is in my understanding are different from each other i think that is that the is moon is, all right is the moon a vacuum Ask um the, the surface you mean the surface of, of the moon the guys that are walking around in that photograph are they in a vacuum from what we are told uh, yes a they near, are a near vacuum the, close yeah. enough There's, yeah yeah and by yeah. and by the way, we can't even create, you know, to create a pure vacuum here, you know, for for clean rooms and stuff down on 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 Earth, um, takes an amazing amount of power. I did not know this. I talked to a, a guy that specializes in clean rooms. He goes, "We have to use the most amazingly huge engines just to get it to ninety nine percent, and the last yeah. percentage we have to do chemically through a leaching process." Yeah. He goes, yeah. "There is no engine big enough to do it." That, so that makes sense because what an this took me a long time 
in teaching science to figure out what a vacuum actually was. And I'm going to say it and you're going to go, of course, but you're not going to learn anything. It's just like, it didn't dawn on me. A vacuum is the natural state of the universe. Right. A vacuum is just an absence of atoms in any area. Another way of thinking about it is that there's actually, you're surrounded by tiny little vacuums all the time right. between any two oxygen or nitrogen molecules in the air around you. Right. Like right. that is by definition <laughs> a, vac a vacuum. To take a fish tank, right, and like to take all of the atoms out is really hard. <laughs> it makes hard. sense to catch some of them chemically, yeah. get them to stick to the sides or whatever chemically. Yeah. Um, and the trouble is, of course, that we live at the bottom of an ocean of air right? where it's what? Let's like, I don't know, it's like 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 pounds like per square. I think it's like 14 pounds per square inch. That's like a cat like stapled to every like square inch of your, your skin, right? There's a lot that is pushing down on us. So we're like one of those deep sea angler fish, yeah. uh, but we don't know it because we are designed to live in this, at the bottom of this particular- 14.7, by the way. I was right about that. Yeah, somewhere about 10-ish. Great, good, yeah. good. Not 100, not one, but about 10. That's that's good for me. Yeah. Um, uh, so you have to, if you were to take all the air out of a fish tank, you have to stop it from being crushed on all sides. Right. Um, in the same way that you would if you were going to pour, I don't know, like a rocks, you know, gravel or whatever all around or something like that. They would break the glass right. or whatever. So all you have to do is figure out how to make a fabric that is thick enough that it's not, that it's going to hold in um, 14 whatever pounds per square inch. I feel like not not just hold, might... not just hold again. Yeah. We're a little different between our explanations here. You're you're talking about survivability, which is oh very very possible. Sure, could you design a fabric that could hold 14 pounds per square inch, uh, in in a vacuum around it? Sure, sure. The problem is articulation, which is and you can look this up online. There's some wonderful things on it where if you expand, because remember the suit is just going to expand to the point to the shape of the suit. Mm -hmm. The problem is is you won't be able to move your arms or legs. And you yeah. certainly won't be able to move your fingers. Mm -hmm. And yet these guys had perfect articulation at all times. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're running around and absolutely had, had no, no trouble at all with it. And, and by, again, I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot here because look, I, I have thought about this for years. I can't even come up with a make-believe reason in that backpack where, you know, I mean, most physicists, full-blown physicists just wave me off. They're like, well, you know, they just did it. They, they, they just, it's like, really, what is it? I go, some people say, well, we lowered it to eight PSI. Some guys even said they lowered it to two PSI. I'm going, okay, so the astronaut's going to die. <laughs> you can't, you can't just keep lowering the pressure down to where it's almost nothing. And uh, so again, survivability with a suit, you know, can you make a, a special Kevlar suit that can survive a vacuum? Sure. But he's still going to be a parade float. You know, he's just going to tip over. He's not going to be able to move, which is why the first suits were plastic and metal, because they knew this. Just to confirm what you're saying, I'm taking a look for a spaceship, uh, sorry, space suit design. And there here are, I think there's some of the earlier that's ones. One of, yeah, that's one of the early exactly suits. Oh, by the way, all the suits, which also bugged me to no end, which was all the suits worked perfectly, right? At no point, I mean, some of the early suits looked like motorcycle suits. And, and it's like, no, no matter what suit design you had, none of them failed at all. They <laughs> all worked. And it's like, okay, what did it? And again, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or anything like that. I, I don't expect an answer on this, to be honest. It's, it's one of those things I threw out there, which is even if you could convince me that there is some <laughs> sort of magical thing that, that you had that could, that could counteract the you know, law of thermodynamics, how'd you do it in 1969 with analog? How'd you do it? Right. And by the way, one more thing uh, as a parting shot on that, just, just, just a little nugget. I, again, I don't want you to answer it, which is, you know, you, you know anybody that scuba dives? Yes. Perfect. You know what the only thing scuba divers care about? Care about how, much, how much air is left. They've got that big dial, you know, that they're constantly looking at. He goes like, oh, yeah, eight minutes left, Frank, we got to go back up. You know, it's never on, on any of the audio files of the moon missions ever. No one cared about how much air they had left. No one even talked about it. No point. At no point, they would say, "Hey, we only got twenty-three minutes of air left. We might get in the buggy and head back." It's like so. The the backpack not only did they have this mythical power of of uh, stopping the vacuum of space and heating and cooling and and carbon scrubbing and all this other crap, but it also had unlimited air. It's like, wow, it's fantastic. It's 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 a miracle. But so I've got a question for you. If they had if they had said, "Okay, what's our air right now? How much air do I have left?" Would that have convinced you that 
it would have, it wouldn't would, would have convinced me the earth isn't flat no but it certainly would have made it more realistic i'm a big believer in writing right i'm a, when i watch a movie it's about the writing it's about the plot and it's like there are certain things you have there's, there's certain continuity things but but again the scuba divers remember it's a big scuba t outfit right it's a, it's a scuba it's a scuba tank yeah. that's all you're talking about which is a whole another thing by the way for you because you i know you get this which is like we, we're breathing in 80 percent nitrogen right well, where'd all the nitrogen come from? Not not here, up there. They had to haul up massive amounts of nitrogen. Uh, and you say, well, no, they they just up the O2. It's like, oh, you got to be careful there. And I'm waiting for an astronaut to forget it if I talk to another one. I talked to Terry Virts a couple of years ago. I should have asked him this, which is, I go, you know, waiting for an astronaut to say, well, we were breathing 80% oxygen. oxygen. I go, oh, no, no, you don't. Any scuba diver will tell you, you can only go up to 40. And at 40, you're pushing it because after that, oxygen becomes toxic. So um, we can follow up on. I know, these, I know. I'm like, throwing out. Stuff like, like, I, I feel like your, if last, I'm, your last question. If I want to respond to these things. Then, then, uh, then we, then we won't, we won't end this. Was that was, that was your final question? That was that was my I final question. But I, I know you don't have an answer yeah. for it because nobody does, including me. I guess I'm actually, but I'm conf I, I feel like the spot where we're differing in this, right? The spot where our models are is that yeah. I, I've heard you say I feel like two different things. One is that you can't imagine how they could make the thing not pop. But then also that not popping isn't the problem. It's the well, articulation okay. it, that's the problem. It, it should well, it should expand to the point of bursting. Now, did they have in a fabric in 1969 that could stop this? Okay, we're, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Sure, maybe they did. But the point was the suit never got to that point, meaning it never expanded at all. The suit was perfectly flexible at all times, and they never had a problem with it. They never did. Inside of a, so I don't know about this. This is fun. But like, couldn't you have a bag inside of a bag? Either way, uh, that's just no. But later. like, like, that, the, like the inner the inner bag, then like would in fact like be eh, really no, same fancy. same thing. It wouldn't wouldn't make any difference. It's no different than a um uh, a basketball. I've thought of this argument too, which is like a basketball has layers, and even if you put an inner bladder inside another bladder, the first yeah. bladder is going to pull the other one. The the, the vacuum is going to expand everything. It doesn't, the, the vacuum doesn't care as long as it's not, it's, if, if it's a hard surface, it's just going to react to the hard surface. But if it's layers of soft surfaces, it's just going to expand and expand and expand. Soft surface is nothing you can do. If you had leather, is leather a hard surface or a soft surface? Well, technically it's soft. Okay. But you're still going to have air behind the leather. That's what it's going after. It's going after the, and again, I'm using the term just to make it sound aggressive, which is, yeah. which is the, the, the pressure wants to get out. So the, the air the, is bouncing around. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the pressure inside the suit is going to, as you know, is going to try to make its way out to, it's going to try to equalize to the, to the nothingness that's outside of it. As long as mm -hmm. there's not a, as long as there's not a hard shell, it's just going to expand and expand and expand. Again, look up any any soft thing you put in a vacuum chamber, uh, in, in a little vacuum chamber here on Earth. There's tons of YouTube's. It just expands, sure. expands, expands, and blows up. If you put a um, leather pouch yeah. that was, you had to sew it up really tight, right? Um, and maybe that's really hard. Um, do you think that the leather pouch being soft would burst? Uh, depending on how it's stitched together, probably. I don't know what kind of leather you're using, but I mean, even what the- it's, What if it's really thick leather? Alligator it, leather, it, brachiosaurus it, it, leather? It, would, it wouldn't matter. Um, anything, depending on how strong the vacuum is. Um, uh, even in a weak vacuum- Hold on, Yes. What do you mean by that? How strong the vacuum is? Well, I think mean, from mean how, mean how, pure, that how pure the vacuum is. You know, like it's just relative yeah. to like, as you're, as you're, like you were saying with the aquarium, as you're sucking the atoms out of the aquarium, it's going to get, the stress is going to get worse and worse. And yeah. supposedly on the moon yes. or in space is about as as bad as it gets. It's measured in um, TOR, T-O-R-R. And yeah. I don't know what the negative version, I can't remember what the scale is off the top of my head, but it's severe. I mean, again, okay. look, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I think I think I figured out where we're, where we're different in this. Um, for the longest time, I had a hard time understanding why air wasn't all sucked up to space because if there's one thing that I knew about a vacuum is that it sucked. And what I've come to understand is that we should never, like, according to... Newtonian physics, we should never use the word sucked. I use the word sucked all the time in my life. Like I'm, I'm pro the word sucked. Yeah, um, but 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 every but nothing sucks, everything blows. <laughs> right. <laughs> when, right. It, when, it, when it comes to pressure. Right. Um the trick to understanding air pressure is that air doesn't magically, you know, or arbitrarily have a pressure. Air should be modeled as a bunch of little bullets, you know, 
dioxide molecules that are shooting around at about as fast as a rifle shoots, right? Between 1,200, 1,400, 1,500 miles an hour going bing, 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 bing. Sure. So sure. what air pressure is, it's not a vacuum sucking it from the outside. No. A pure, a pure vacuum is not like, ma like a lot. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's not like a lot stronger. It's it's the temperature of the air on the inside. So if the leather could withstand those tiny little molecules shooting around at rifle speeds, um, then it can then it then it won't pop. Oh, okay. Again, it, it, again, we we probably shouldn't dwell on this. I, it's something you should probably think about when you get a chance. But yes, as far again, yeah. different. You're right. The difference between again. Is there a fabric out there that can withstand? Sure, you can make a basketball and can put it in a, va a vacuum chamber with a special texture that wouldn't detonate like a bomb, but mm -hmm. it would be under immense stress. My my again, my bigger thing is the suit wasn't under any stress at all. Arms and legs working great. At no point again did the astronauts say, "Wow, it's kind of hard to work my arms and my fingers with my suit." Perfect articulation points, putting together complex mm -hmm. electronic devices at of the day. You know, like the like the satellite dish, which is a whole a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it just it, sorry, it, it's yeah. it, I, in yeah. fact I'm, I made a video on it called uh, the the um, for loss of a nail. You know the the famous thing for loss of a nail. The you know the horse was lost, the rider was yeah. lost, the battle was lost. And it was yeah, like, yeah. look, if the suit doesn't work, if the suit doesn't work like it's advertised, right? If it can't, then that's a plot hole. It's a it's a suspension of disbelief, which means that everything that yeah. uses the suit can't be real. And so I, I pick on the suit, which is why the challenge. I go again. Put me in a suit. No one's even tried. No one's even tried to put me in a in a vacuum chamber because they know what would happen. I because I I'd ask them before. I go, hey, open up the backpack. Tell me what's in there. Like, and again, I can't. The closest I can even come fictionally is a force field to keep that to keep that suit working the way it is. And it's like, yeah, well, 1969. You don't have yeah. that. So if we ever talk again in the future, I'd be interested in pursuing this, but you're totally right. Sure. So let me get to the okay, should, your last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You've been wonderful in this, by the way. Thank you so much. Oh, I'll try. Um, uh, okay, so I love this so much, and I'm sure you've heard this before, and I'm sure you have an answer to this, and I really am excited to hear what this what? is. What? I cannot I'm, I'm get look, I I'm looking at the AE map, which I which I yeah, 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 like yeah. one of the first people to ever um, bring this up. But go ahead. Just like I, I love this projection. Um, so here's Santiago, Chile. Uh, here is Los Angeles. Yep. Uh, here is flight path Sydney. Yeah. 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 So the um, flight time, pardon me, between um, uh, Chile and LA is about twelve hours. Right. About I forget exactly. Yep. The flight time between LA and um, and Sydney and in Australia is about 12 hours. Right. So how long is the flight time between Chile and Sydney? Right. The answer is, now this may be approximate numbers, like something like 24 hours, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, maybe quite a bit more, right. maybe quite a bit less. Yep. But, and I'm guessing that you know that like if you hop on a plane, yep. <laughs> right? Like you can, you can do the flight trackers and you can see like, when they leave yesterday, I was actually tracking one just in preparation for this. I have a, sc I have a screenshot. It's kind of neat um, uh, of how you know how long it took to get here, right. and the answer is a grand total of about twelve hours. Right. I think it's like thirteen or fourteen or something, right. something like that. Right. Um, how how can that be how, done? How do you guys yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two things. One. And and I'll be I'll brutally honest as I can because yes, people have, have mentioned it. Uh, even though yeah. the argument we throw back at, at people usually is okay. Well, why the the bigger the bigger question there is why? Are, again, you're using a, a one of our straight line maps, which is which is wonderful because mm -hmm. in on a globe there's so many there's so many flights that we point out. It's like a, the the flight goes. Oh, again, this only happens when you're when you're going south to to south. It arcs over the the north and then comes back down. Uh, and on here it goes a straight line. Uh, mm -hmm. Two things would be one. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab, maybe an extra fast jet stream that uh, that helps out the plane. That's that's faster than reported. So if the jet stream runs between what 100 and 130 miles an hour, maybe there's a jet stream out there that goes that goes faster. Don't know. Okay. Uh, but the other one, which you know, I got to throw out there is, can you? Uh, and I, I don't expect you to do this right this second, but can you show me the entire flight path with latitude and longitude coordinates while it's happening? 
because and it's something I pointed out in the clues, which is when flights get about 150. Now with this, it's going to be tricky because you're not going to be you're not even going to see it until after it leaves. Is that leaving San Francisco or is it leaving? Where's it? Where's it bouncing off? LA. LA. Okay, it's, we'll it's, say it's yeah, we'll say LA. Yeah. When it leaves Los Angeles on on the way to uh, Australia, when it gets about 150 miles off sea off the coast. When it's not within any ground radar, because I believe the GPS system is just the the old Loran system, the old defense Loran system, which was radar ground radar based, where they just put slaps another sticker on it and say, "Oh, we got a bunch of satellites." But when it gets out there, the the plane gets lost. It literally goes into approximated or estimated modes, and the latitude and longitude, which is which is their nice way of saying we know approximately where it is. We know if you keep going in this heading, by the time you get to, uh, you know, about 150 miles off of Australia or where, wherever the closest ground station is, you'll show back up on the radar. Oh no, your, your little icon may, may still be there. You know, you, you may see it on the graphics, but you try to look up the latitude and longitude, uh, you, you won't see it, which to my point, which is, okay, can you show me the exact route? Uh, which you know, it, 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 now does that again? Does that disprove the globe? Not necessarily, but it is interesting that the GPS system, which is thirty-two overlapping blanket coverage satellites, lose planes on a regular basis. And not just that. Real quick, from Los Angeles, if you went, I think Hawaii, you can see there barely. It's like a pixel uh, off of um, off of Los Angeles. When you go from Los, you know, because there's no islands between um, Los Angeles and Hawaii. When you get off of Los Angeles from like one hundred fifty miles, you go into approximated or estimated mode. It's not just the Southern Hemisphere. It's everywhere where there isn't a ground radar station, which sure. is again one was one of my um, uh, one of my points from the original clues. So yeah, no, I, I got you. That is that is probably our second okay. weakest weakest point on that because we don't we don't know exactly. Which is like I I take a guess and be you know the the planes are again they're not breaking the sound barrier. They just have a massive tailwind, so the pilots don't know any different. You know from their standpoint, you know when they're when they're measuring airspeed again. Commercial airlines aren't supposed to go past the sound barrier anyway. Uh, you know, the Concords have been discontinued for a while. So yeah. there you go. By the way, the, the biggest... The, back, excitingly. The biggest point, the, the weakest point, the, I got to throw this at you because you didn't bring it up. I was a little surprised. The weakest point of the, the flat Earth model has to do with the sun, which is 24 hours of Antarctic sun. The people ask me all the time, what's, what's the weakest point? I go, it's 24 hour Antarctic sun. Can't happen on a flat Earth with one light source. Because, you know, if you want to do one light source, you know, on the on the inner track, you know, for the Arctic sun. Oh, yeah, that's easy. You can do that all day long. But the Antarctic sun, you can't. And some people, so there's two schools of thought there. One people say uh, that, well, you know, there's some, they're doing some funny camera issues and there's not 24 hours on Antarctica. I go, I don't know. I know some photographers down in Antarctica and they, sw guys I can trust. And they swear that there's 24 hour Antarctic sun. If that's the case, there's got to be a second light source. But since we don't know exactly what the light sources are and how they're doing it, wouldn't surprise me at all, but I decided to throw that in there. Would it be a second light source if it, they can look up in the sky and they see the sun? Like the, the sun is, that the light is coming from the sun. If they put their hands out, there's a shadow behind their hands. Well, that's just it. I don't, I don't know. There's got, yeah. there's something going on in Antarctica again, which leads into the Antarctic Treaty and why no one's allowed to go down there unless you're going for tourists or you're a military or military scientist. Yeah. And then you go down there, you know, look up other things like, you know, why doesn't the compass work in Antarctica? It should, you know, you're, you're big into magnetics, which is why. Just, uh, 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 just yeah, just to st sticking, just to stick. Yeah, sorry, this. sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, but you're so right. You're right. I, there is a problem there. No question. And, and let me just say, I really appreciate you saying <laughs> that. Um, uh, I hope I've been as open about my non-understanding of things as you are. Like, you really need to be oh, praised you, you have, for that. You're doing well, you're doing a wonderful job at this. You're being very rational about this. Thank you. Well, very, well, very no, I, I, appropriately I, I, humble in your epistemology. Thank you very much. No, and thank you for for um, your your delivery type. I I enjoyed the whole thing. The um for for me, I look. We don't know everything. Absolutely no question. One of our biggest arguments is that look, we have plot holes, but you have more plot holes. Or the 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 heliocentric, uh, geocentric, heliocentric. Uh, round earth uh, yeah the solar system the solar World system heads. model has the solar okay. system model has more plot holes therefore you go with the lesser of two evils and uh but yeah this is this is one of ours absolutely because we don't know the details of it we know when you get a chance you really should look at the jet stream model inside that app it's really cool but it's um if the jet stream is much much faster then yeah that would be a sneaky little way of and again i don't think even the pilots know i feel is, like though you had said earlier that the jet streams are in circles, right? Yes. 
So depending so, on where depending on where the circles were, for example, let's say he left Los Angeles. Yeah. We'll just use your circle there. I don't think that's exactly the one. You really should yeah, look I, it up. You know chat. nothing about it. But let's say that jet stream right there <laughs> was 250 miles an hour, right? Or 300 miles sure. an hour faster. Sure. You could sneak into it. The plane, you know, goes at a really high rate of speed. And by the time you get off of it, well, you know, by the mm -hmm. time you get in Australia, you've gained quite a bit of time. Pilots wouldn't know any different because the airspeed's not going to show anything. GPS isn't going to sh no, show anything for the pilots because remember, the GPS tells you where it wants you to say that you are. GPS is a military system. It is not a civilian system. It is completely DOD from the 1990s. So the, yeah, it will show you how to get to the nearest Starbucks, but it could also steer you away from certain things if it wants to. It's what I would do anyway. I've got a question for you about this, which is that... It's about 12 hours or whatever, right? Going sure. from, uh, and, and I totally agree with you that uh, jet streamy wind sort of things do, sure. does need to come into our flight time calculations. Right. It takes uh, a little bit less time to go from Seattle to Minnesota than it does vice versa. Exactly. Usually. Yeah. Usually. Right? Yep. Um, uh, but it's 12-ish hours, right? Um, from my, in my understanding, and maybe I'm factually wrong about this, yeah. um, from uh, uh, South America to Australia, but it's the same amount of time, roughly, from Australia back to South America. Hmm. If you're hopping a ride on on these, unless like they were going way the heck out of the way and going across Asia instead, which you yeah, know, if I'd, I'd have to take a I'd have to take a look at it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, it's just it's just a theory, but yeah, okay. I, I I hear you, and and it's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, this has been a delight. I've been looking forward to this, and this was, I don't know, every bit as good, maybe a little bit better even, as I hoped it would be. Oh, Thank you so very much for doing this. Um, can we make sure that we get the uh, link that you mentioned for Want of a Nail? Uh, send If you could email that to me, I'll put that up on oh, the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. And then my I people, will... where should they go to find out about you? Oh, yeah. You don't have to do anything special. Um, the easiest way, because people like easy, is uh, just go you could type into any search engine, Flat Earth <laughs> Mark. That's it. And I'm not stealing from Flat Earth Dave. I'm pretty sure I came up with it first because the search engines, if you type in Flat Earth, there's there's so much other stuff. Everybody's covered yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But Flat Earth Mark will take you to, if you type it in YouTube, you'll get to my channel. If you type it into Google, you'll run into all sorts of fun stuff. And from there, you you know, you go down to whatever rabbit holes that, that you see fit. So You also have a pretty darn good Wikipedia page. Let me just say that. You have a bunch <laughs> and of by the way, they, crap they, in your background that like actually gets shown in like a respectful, accurate way. I don't know if like your goons are like always editing that. I, I mean, that is that's a, just, a, no, no, that's it just it. I don't know who my goons are. <laughs> we all have our goons. I, I, I literally, if I live long enough to, to, to <laughs> hear, that's a quote. I should, I should steal that from myself. The, uh, no, it is because I, I've had um, people, uh, uh, come to me and and they uh, they'll they'll do stuff, but they they'll never never tell me who it is, right? People that'll that'll do things. So wait, when people say, oh yeah, you got some people. In fact, I didn't even look at my wiki page until 2023, and then somebody said, oh, you have a wiki page. I'm going, what? I do. I go, made it, man. You made it. I go, who did it? I go, I. But they, yeah, thank you to whoever whoever does that. Some yeah. uh, I, I do know some of the people that help me, but the rest of it, I only run my YouTube channel. I mean, some people say, oh, you have a Facebook page. I go, yeah. I don't run it. I, you know, I've got, <laughs> I've got Rumble awesome. and BitChute and Brideon and, and all that stuff. But, uh, but again, like you were saying in the beginning of the show, uh, the, the, one of the best resources ever, I mean, it's part of it is my channel cause it's been up for so long, but the app, the app is great. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on it and there's a lot of cool stuff and I know people like apps and, uh, so it's, it's fun. There's a lot of, there's a lot of neat, there's a, some, some really slick things uh, on the app. I got to look at it. I think I, there's more power to it than I had understood. Um, if anyone is interested who didn't find out about this video from me, I run uh, sciencesweird.com, the science teaching company online. Um, and then I also write a sub stack called the Lost Tools of Learning, okay. where we're sort of redesigning all schooling in our heads and then also in the real world. It's exciting. Uh, Losttools.substack.com is how you get to that. Everyone, thank you so very much for this. Uh, and Mark, my goodness, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. See ya.